Good day, everyone. Alan Schimmel, DevOps.com. Welcome to another DevOps.com webinar. Today's webinar is sponsored by our friends at TaskTop, and I think it's going to be one of our best yet. It's actually a look back on uh, 2017 DevOps Enterprise favorites called from the uh, DevOps Enterprise Summit run by Gene Kim and IT Revolution, or does as many of us call it. And we're going to get a really good look at both Gene and Dr. Mick Kirsten, co-founder and CEO of TaskTop. You know, what, what do they consider their favorites from this past year's Does events? And, and maybe we'll even have a little news about upcoming Does London, Does Europe in London in June. Before we get started, though, let me just quickly mention for those new uh, to our webinars, we have our go to webinar control panel, which for most of you is in the top right hand corner of your screen. Uh, you'll see a little question section there. <clears throat> Excuse me. And if you click the arrow to put, make it face downwards, it'll expand. And you can see you can ask questions in there. And this is really important for this webinar because unfortunately, we're probably going to take up the full hour with Gene and, and Mick's um, presentation. However, they, have, they were kind enough to ask if we can get the questions in written format here. We will submit them to both the TaskTop and IT Revolution team, and we'll try to get you answers, right? We, we respect your time and appreciate everyone joining in with us. So don't be afraid. Don't be shy. Ask questions in real time. They'll be queued. And we'll do our best to get to them after. If, if we do have time, we'll do them right on air. But if not, we'll, we'll, we'll have a record of them. We'll do our best to get to them. With that being said, if you have any technical issues, perhaps the slides aren't rolling or what have you, you can, uh, we do have engineers standing by. If you go to the chat section of your control panel and type in, if you're able to type in your particular problem, we'll do our best to rectify that and get you uh, running with a smooth webinar experience. So that should take care of that. Let me answer one other question that's always asked, and that is, is this being recorded? Will the slides be available? Yes and yes, this is being recorded. It will be available via DevOps.com and TazTop, and the uh, slide deck will be available, enhanced with updated links to many of the presentations that Mick and Gene are going to be talking about. So with that being said, let's move on. As I said, I, our panel today really needs no introduction. First of all, returning is Dr. Mick Kirsten. Nick is the co-founder and CEO of TaskTop. Always a pleasure to have on our webinars, knowledgeable. Mick, welcome. Thank you, Alan. Great to Thank be here. Thank you. And then secondly is my friend, actually the person who got me into DevOps many years ago, um, Gene Kim, author, researcher, uh, founder of IT Revolution, and all around DevOps kind of guy. Gene, welcome. Hey, great to be here again, Alan. Happy New Year. You too. Happy New Year to everyone out there. Guys, We I already took up three minutes. We don't have three minutes to waste. Take it away. I'm sitting back and looking forward to this one. Uh, awesome. Yeah, the, the uh, purpose of uh, this webinar is actually to share uh, some of our favorite talks from DevOps Enterprise. And so just uh, a brief introduction to DevOps Enterprise. Uh, this, we're going to the for uh, fourth year, uh, going to the fifth year now. Um, and so it was really uh, originally conceived as a technology co a conference for technology leaders who are transforming how technology work is done in large complex organizations. So showing that DevOps is not just for the unicorns, but for the horses. So in the early years, uh, there were no unicorns allowed. It was really uh, just uh, people from uh, a large complex organization that have been around for decades or even centuries. And the uh, primary uh, type of talks that are given there are experience reports. Very specifically, uh, we had each person give a 30-minute presentation uh, in this format. Uh, tell me about the industry you compete in. Tell us about your organization. Uh, what was the business problem that you set out to solve? Uh, where did you start and why? Uh, what did you do? What were the outcomes? Uh, what problems still remain? And over the years, uh, we've built up over 200 and now probably 40 case studies uh, of large complex organization transforming, uh, including some of the largest brands and most recognized brands in almost every industry vertical. And uh, Mick, you and I have uh, had so many conversations about uh, the journeys that these technology leaders uh, are going undergoing. Um, any, uh, and it's been 
this for me it's just been such a privilege to help chronicle these journeys any thoughts on that mick uh yes and i think for me the, the really big thing and for those of you who haven't attended the conference for me the the first conference the first one i attended was it, it was you know just a big phase shift because i'd been attending almost every industry conference that i knew of in the agile lean sort of space um around software delivery every vendor conference uh with with all the partners that stuff has and it was you know, walking to that room and again, hearing that conversation shift from here's how everything worked beautifully uh, in our internet scale business if, you know, for this unicorn or that unicorn or this, this brand new startup with, with 30 staff into <laughs> how things actually work at scale in the enterprise was so much more closely aligned to what our customers are dealing with, where the actual real interesting problems uh, with DevOps, with scaling software delivery lie. So I, I always recommend this as the, as the number one show for, for basically everyone I talked to to go to. And for me personally, it's it's the highest learning moment usually of the year, both both San Francisco and London, uh, both in terms of what we see on stage and then you know, Gene and I get to get to try to process that after because we're continuing learning even after the show, uh, even through these conversations. And of course, the, the conversations that happen there. So I uh, hope to see even more of you at, who are tuning into this into this uh, attending the next one because there's there's nothing like being immersed in in all of this uh, sharing and learning so awesome and so uh, we have put together our favorite uh, if we have time for it, the top 10 uh, presentation that we've chosen from uh, DevOps Enterprise uh, San Francisco that was just uh, two months ago so uh, Mick I believe you are up first yeah and so for me I think that there's and there's, there's just there was so much great content it's always hard to pick the favorite ones <laughs> but I've what I've done here and I think what Gene's done here as well is just pick some of the ones that shifted our thinking the most and this is one from Barclays from Jonathan Smart, who's the head of development there, who gave a general session that was just fascinating. So I'll try to highlight a few of the key points here and really why it's a little bit different, why it caused me to think differently and why I think it, it should cause some of those organizations who, who are doing something similar to what Barclays did to, to think a little bit differently. So for Barclays, this, is, this was a presentation that's about how you do, how you get these benefits that again, you'll hear digital natives, you'll hear startups getting in the small, but how you do that at Barclays scale, how you do that at organizations that have been around for, for over 100 years. Uh, Jonathan Smart pointed out, I think that Barclays has been a long, around as long as basically as currency uh, has been right. around. So, <laughs> That's why I created the year 1690. <laughs> Pre yes, exactly. <laughs> Yet at the same rate, it, it, we all know that these organizations have to go through these transformations, and they have. Oh, to go sorry, one, one more data point, uh, and uh, so they have about thirty thousand engineers, broadly defined as Dev, QA, Operations, Security. So just you know, Barclays scale means tens of thousands of engineers. Yeah, exactly, and this is this is I think where the points where we see things get get very interesting with these modernizations efforts, these digital transformation efforts, or whatever you call them, these these DevOps transformation efforts, uh, and how you actually get those benefits that you see, but with the control that you need in a regular industry, in a safety critical industry, again at, at these, but also at these kinds of scales, and so I think that the really big I think shift that that John Smart challenged the audience with is um, is how you approach an agile transfer, transformation. And I think this, this, we hear this a lot. Sometimes we hear these called DevOps transformations. And his, his point was don't. Don't do an agile transformation. Barclays had been doing enough attempts at an agile transformation and having weird symptoms from that. He said that the organization actually needs to focus on the out outcomes. And, and what are those outcomes? Um, so those outcomes are flow and quality and happiness for the practitioners, for the IT staff, for the developers, the engineers, the operations staff, and value. So rather than go into an existing line of business and say, do you want us to do this agile transformation for you? Uh, John started going to the different business units and saying, do you want to have higher velocity flow? Do you want to have more quality? Do you want to have happier uh, engineers and developers and staff? Uh, do you want to deliver more value to the business? And those answers are obviously yes. Whereas so many, and this is, I've encountered this over and over again, so many large scale organizations, the 10, 20,000, 30,000, in the case of Barclays, uh, IT staff organizations have had these fits and starts of transformations. And I think a lot of them have actually come from Agile where uh, Agile really was, a lot of the practices around Agile, you know, the concepts and the theories are amazing. I think we certainly practice them at Tesla. I, I, I have since the Kent Beck XP book. But the way that you scale those was never sufficiently specified. I think what organizations are noticing is that what's happened with, with DevOps uh, is that 
there's a kernel there that starts working. Once you start automating your continuous integration, your continuous delivery, look at your, your end-to-end -end delivery pipeline, something starts working. It becomes actually decides how to scale that. But the reality is that a lot of organizations have been burned by some kind of failed agile transformation and not quite understood why. And the concepts of either just scaled agile framework either came too late or were too complex or, or something, even though there's some great concepts there. So I think the shift here is just focus on the outcomes, focus on end-to-end on -end flow through your value stream, rather than again saying, okay, we're gonna just do everything differently right now. And everyone's gonna have, the, the entire business is gonna have to learn what epics are. So the outcome oriented, view here is that you again you, you get faster flow through the value stream you get higher quality and you don't lose control and i think one of the most fascinating things that uh john smart presented that he did at barclays is to actually create what what he called the lean control tool so the fact that barclays does have very rigorous requirements uh they the risk requirements and security requirements and those kinds of things that often feel like they're fuzzier or they should be part of the pipeline and so on he's actually integrated them right into the agile planning cycle uh, right into the visibility for the business um and right into the really the, the devops and delivery pipeline uh, so you can see that value he's actually integrated that the happiness this one was near and dear to me and we know that when you look at an and a lar really large scale value streams with hundreds of teams the actual productivity, the flow through those value streams has to do with how happy the people are doing the work. That's why organizations like TaskTop, that's why the, uh, the the good companies out there do things like measuring employee net promoter score, because we know that happier developers, developers that don't have to do all this tedious or manual work, developers that actually get to see their code shipping on a, on a daily basis or at least a weekly basis are actually much happier and feeling their impact than those that have to wait for six weeks to get a license and then another two months to get a, a, a <laughs> <laughs> uh, Yeah, Gene, I'm sure you'll have some thoughts there. So actually these things are measurable and you can have the speed and control if you take this end-to-end -end view and if you take the systems thinking view of connecting those parts in your business, like the controls, filling in the gaps. It's, what's amazing is that Barclays Bar actually created their lean control tool. Um, and they had to connect that to their you know, older school project management, as well as their newer school agile um, systems. And then of course, connect all, all of that to the to the delivery pipeline, that, that's what delivers the value. So I actually think this shift, especially for the leaders who are struggling with fits and starts of these agile transformations, this, this shift to results is a great one. Do you know yeah, any other yeah, um, on this one? Uh, last, uh, yeah, just a, just a comment. I was uh, reflecting as you were uh, talking. You know, the, on the uh, the safety panel, we we're actually we had a four-hour film session, and we were actually uh, talking about well, how the same thing happened in the lean community. Is that um, you know, as you had like in in the lean community, uh, eventually you had to get to a uh, a product to sell, whether it was training or uh, toolkits or whatever. And then there's some sort of so something bad that happens uh, potentially, right? Where um, you know, you, it's more about the acquisition about about the product around the product as it is about the outcomes, uh, and uh, you know, and, and that was even books are the same way, right? Is that uh, somehow in the productification, productization of these movements, uh, you know, we, we lose sight of the outcomes, and so uh, you know, uh, the, the observation that you had about the agile transformation that which will probably very well happen with the DevOps uh, community, right? Uh, I think kind of the way we proactively deal with that in the community is doing what John has done, right? Is like it's not about uh, the broad umbrella practices, really about the outcomes. I, I thought it was just uh, brilliantly uh, uh, presented. Yeah, and I, I completely agree with that, Gene. I, I, I just do think that the that the DevOps community is standing on a stronger foundation, not to mess this up as just, you know, just a proliferation of consulting services that say don't meet a large scale customer need because it is based on a, you know, a tool platform automation and, and results. Um, so I actually think we're, we're standing mm. on some of the pitfalls that we, this is my view at least, some of the pitfalls that we saw with the agile community having trouble speaking to the scale of these large organizations. Uh, again, I think that the, the DevOps community is, is actually standing on a stronger foundation here. So. And I think we're very acutely aware of the cargo culting risk. So uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, should we go to the next one? Okay, perfect. Um, the next one is, um, uh, and, and like uh, Mick, I'll, I'll uh, preface this by saying these are not in rank order. These are just the top ten. So the 
broad population. These are the ten <laughs> that uh, you know we chose to uh, present. This is so thought provoking. Now, uh, one of those would have to be um, John Rester, uh, John, as we call him, John Rez, uh, from uh, Key Bank, uh, now SVP and Director of Continuous Delivery. Uh, so he presented, and uh, he presented this year with Stephanie Gillespie, SVP of uh, Head of Digital Channel. Technology. Sorry about the typo. Um, and so maybe on the next slide, uh, here's some of the, the context of what makes this so interesting to me. So John Rez uh, attended DevOps Enterprise in 2015, and he left saying, uh, "You know, this is something that we must do at uh, at Key." Uh, and then he submitted a talk, um, and we accepted it in 2016. And it was just astounding. Uh, the 2016 gist of the presentation was that there was this customer impacting outage where basically all the consumer banking properties went down for a, a day. And he um, essentially responded to that by proposing that there must be, uh, there was an urgent need to modernize the technology platform um, that uh, Key was re uh, residing upon. And one of the uh, and so he came back in 2017, uh, 2016 to actually present that story. Um, and one of the things I just loved about it was uh, he put together this amazing diagram uh, just showing uh, whenever a consumer uh, had to uh, uh, log in to the bank, uh, there's something like 230 network connections that had to be made, often ping-ponging between data centers, and just showing how uh, what was actually built originally for redundancy has actually uh, magnified the risk of outages. Um, and incidentally, uh, the way that this amazing animated slide was created was uh, through a C-sharp uh, program that he wrote that they called a resonator. So just a, I think another mark of these technology leaders is that they are um, their technology, they're close to technology as well as being very business savvy. So what was interesting is that uh, in 2016 he presented about how they moved the entire consumer online banking properties into Docker containers, running it in Kubernetes on OpenShift, uh, and radically transforming how uh, you know the, the deployment model, uh, the automation model at KeyBank. Uh, this year, we asked. Uh, this last year, we asked him uh, to uh, present with um, his partner in crime, Stephanie Gillespie. And, and so the story that he told was how that they worked together essentially to. Uh, the way they sold this project was to uh, advance this as a way to achieve uh, what they called the Digital 17 uh, initiative. So uh, in other words, this was the um, digital disruption, uh, the need to reduce the cost and time to experiment, uh, make it more safe. Um, that was being driven by Beth Moody, the CEO of, uh, of KeyBank. And, and so part of this audacious uh, proposal was actually to uh, do this initially in 16 months. They took it down to less than 12 months. And the reason they did this was that they wanted to, uh, they had just acquired um, Ni First Niagara. It was the largest acquisition in the company history. And what they wanted to avoid was having to onboard and transition all their customers once and then have to do it again to get them into the Digital 17 platform. And so they actually shrunk the timeline from you know uh, 16 months down to less than a year. Uh, and so uh, this is what, well, I just love it because what sounds very injudicious <laughs> right, in terms of uh, you know uh, reducing the timeline was actually something that was I think incredibly savvy and created incredible business value. So uh, the the uh, the other thing that I thought was uh, remarkable and uh, so memorable for me about this presentation was that uh, this project actually was being talked about uh, on CNBC Mad Money with Jim Cramer. Uh, you know, my friend John Willis, he's a co-author in the DevOps Handbook, uh, he said, we know DevOps will have made it when it's actually on CNBC Mad Money. He said that in 2010, and uh, that actually happened in 2017. This was actually on the Red Hat earnings call <laughs> where, uh, you know, KeyBank was being mentioned uh, with containers uh, and Docker, <laughs> you know, uh, in the context of helping uh, deliver business value for KeyBank, and, uh, and just uh, to see this level of support from the CEO of the company uh, was just something that is absolutely remarkable. I think will make uh, 2017 uh, was one of the hallmark events for me for uh, 2017. Uh, Mick, any comments on that? Yeah, I think that for me, the you, you touched on the most uh, the most memorable part of that talk, which is and there's there's just some amazing amazing content in it. But when when he showed that diagram of again the the trace of network connections made on a <laughs> fairly sophisticated network, 
for for I think it was one customer transaction. It was just mind blowing, and just it made me. And again, the fact that he was able to generate this, how he did it, like writing this this code himself. But <laughs> it was just making me imagine if only we could have that kind of sort of visibility, that that way of spotting a bottleneck, or the way that we you know we flood our teams with requests uh, for you know, for a, a delivery value stream for where what happened when we addressed an incident across teams and the way they scrambled. That, that, that's that's exactly what I was thinking of the same kind of visibility that we can have for. A, you know, our, our service architectures, um, our backend systems, if we could have them for a delivery pipeline, that wouldn't, wouldn't that be amazing? So I thought that was just super cool. And um, when, uh, yeah, it's funny because uh, what was so remarkable about that in, in the network transactions uh, and, and equally true for uh, the, the flow of work in a software delivery value stream is that no silo sees the problem, right? There's like they see the tickets come in and out, they get closed, <laughs> no problem. But when you zoom out far enough, uh, you know, it becomes evident that something terrible is actually happening. That's introducing tremendous risk to the business. <laughs> that, I mean, that, that was exactly it. Is that if you, I was, you know, you imagine yourself as being the admin for one of those servers or one of those those, those parts of the app portfolio, you wouldn't, you would not see the problems like exactly. Like, no, <laughs> the problem, but you see that there's no way we can scale transaction processing if this is what it looks like. Yeah, awesome. Uh, yeah, let's go to the next one. That was feedback. All right, so John Allspot. So this this uh, this may have been one of the most uh, technically profound and sophisticated talks I heard, and it was just mind blowing. And I'm going to just touch on a part of it. And by the way, I did want to mention that in, um, each one of these talks is recorded on YouTube. So just just go on YouTube, search for the name and DevOps San Francisco, and, and it'll pop right up. We'll also have the the links and the downloadable slides as well. But um, Gene, could you just in, the way that uh, you introduced John uh, and the way that he then introduced himself. If you could just recap that, because I think it'll uh, signal just how Yeah, it so uh, I think many people will uh, recognize John's contributions. I mean, it is uh, probably really impossible to overstate how significant his contributions are. He, um, he was responsible for really kicking off the DevOps movement in many people's uh, view in his famous uh, 2009 presentation um, that he did of 10 deploys a day at every day at Flickr with uh, uh, his uh, dev counterpart Paul Hammond. Uh, he is uh, was one of the chairs of the Velocity Conference for uh, nearly a decade. Uh, he then became the CTO uh, at um, at Etsy, where he helped build a world class technology organization that went public uh, two years ago. And now he is uh, uh, created a company called Adaptive Capacity Labs, where he's working with uh, some of the most uh, largest luminaries in the safety culture space. Uh, he invented the post-mortem practice. Uh, he has um, really adapted all the safety culture learnings to the DevOps uh, world that we live in. And he presented, it to, to, towards the start of this talk, he presented just this fascinating view, sort of zoomed in out of it. We're not gonna do it justice right now. I certainly won't. <laughs> um, you, you should, if you're interested by anything that, that we say here, you should watch this talk because John's got, such a profound um, understanding of how these large scale and complex, complicated and complex, and I'm sure for some is clear, chaotic systems systems work. And he presented this view where we have to look at the systems below the line, and that's where the actual um, transactions um, and operations and applications are actually working. This is this is the real stuff we're working. This is the the level of the the, the processors and the networks. And he pointed out that we never in these large systems, we never really understand the systems below the line. And I think, Gene, the, the key bank example is similar, right? That was one transaction that could have been just seconds, those, those <laughs> 230 network connections that were made. And of course, all of these systems are, are scaling. So we sort of have to accept that we've got, we, we work on these systems below the line, but as they're executing, as they're becoming more, more complex, as the data sets that they're processing change their behavior even more, um, the, what's happening below the line is like the complexity is just is, is just growing, um, but then yes. above the line is is actually our representation of the system. So for a developer, you might be thinking of, of your type hierarchy. For someone on the operation side, you might be thinking about your 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 microservice architecture and so on. And this is where we frame our understanding of the system. And those those things don't often don't always match. People have different views of it. People. You know, people have contributed different parts of it, and the complexity is now you know, beyond what a single person or a single team or even a set of teams teams can handle. 
So if you accept that for a moment, the this is I think the one the most accessible probably uh, lessons learned from the talk that we can all apply right now. But I think it's a really really profound point. So if we think now of what should drive software design, what should drive architecture, when I just move back for a second, uh, a lot of the architectural practices that we've had have been around creating these kinds of layerings and architectures below the line that that you know will scale and will provide us a good separation of concerns between the model and the views and the presentation layers and so on. Um, but things are just getting much more complex than that. And so John said, well, what if we look at what acts on the stuff below the line? And again, with his experiences with internet scale, with, with Etsy, um, what really should be shaping the design of new components, the, the design of subsystems, is this flow of incidents. And the, this, this quote was just you know, mind-blowingly brilliant to me when I heard that incidents of yesterday inform the architecture of tomorrow. So what we really should be architecting is a system that's going to more gracefully support whatever that set of incidents is tomorrow. And rather than architecting for this, you know, for perfect or perfect layering or perfect modularity, whatever our preconceptions are from our from our past work as, as software architects or operations architects, we really should be optimizing our value streams for supporting that next flow of incidents. And for me, this was this really hit home because a lot of what, what I've been thinking about is in terms of organizations that are shifting, and this is what's happening with all of our customers, from a project-oriented mentality and this you know, contractor control model to a product-oriented mentality, which is key to a digital transformation where you're really looking at bringing products and features of those products to market faster and, and measuring the revenue results rather than measuring whether, whether your project completed on time and on budget. Um, you really want to optimize your entire software architecture and your entire end-to-end -end value stream architecture for the flow of features. The more features you can bring to market, the more competitive you'll be, the more delighted your users will be, and hopefully the, the better your revenue results and success. Um, and John presented his stories, here, his stories here on how you actually need to also optimize that same value stream, that same stuff below the line, even your understanding above the line, which is why the blameless post-warnings are so key because the, the difficult incidents are really complex. You might need 40 people hmm. in a room to understand what got you there. But really, this got me thinking about our architectures need to be um, optimized for that future flow of incidents. And I think he had this other great quote in there, which was that uh, incidents are unplanned investments. And again, I thought this, this, is, this is exactly how we should, this is the way that we should be thinking about our end-to-end -end system architectures. Gene, any more thoughts? Yeah, on this? Why, yeah, yeah. Two things. In fact, um, uh, one is just uh, there's a uh, so just a little more specificity around above the line, below the line. So, below the line is everything uh, that our systems run on. So that's the code repos, that's the ticketing systems, that's the uh, artifact repository, that's our uh, you know it's everything behind the screens. It's our monitoring tools. It's uh, uh, you know it's basically everything it's, it's uh, the environments the containers uh, and what's above the line is everything in front of the screen so that's uh, our, our people it's uh, the uh, it's our meetings it's uh, it's basically where the cognition happens is where we're trying to create the mental models and, and I was uh, in, in this I'm doing this project with uh, John Willis uh, called the beyond the Phoenix project and we had an hour just discussing this and I, one of the profound epiphanies for me that really helped me <laughs> understand how Critical John Allspaw's observation is is that is the MIT beer game. There's this famous um, uh, game that was created at MIT uh, where it essentially had like ten turns. You had three players. Uh, one was a beer manufacturer, a beer distributor, and one was a retailer. And there's only one action you take, which is an order from your upstream supplier. Um, and uh, you know essentially. Uh, what they found was that in 95% of trials, uh, everybody's out of business by you know long before the tenth turn because the feedback loops are so slow, uh, and the link between cause and effect uh, are uh, are just so obscured because of the latency. It takes a couple turns for orders to actually get fulfilled. Um, so here is. Uh, uh, a very simple system: three nodes, <laughs> um, you know, and ten turns, uh, and if that system has these kind of complex characteristics where it is very difficult to control. Think of something that is running on you know tens of thousands of systems, uh, you know, running across three, millions of lines of code. Uh, if we can't even, you know, if if the MIT beer game is below the line, <laughs> you know, even knowing the rules does not help us, uh, you know, achieve good results. So I think for me this was just a, it uh, uh, just showed how utterly complex. 
uh, the systems we rely upon are, and all we have are things above the line. Uh, am I? Am I does that make sense, Mick? I mean, I, I thought you were getting oh, yeah. kicked out of that in terms of. Yeah, no, I think I, I, exactly. I think the fact that you're making it just more concrete: what's above the line, what's below the line. I think I think is key. And yeah, just the, the sheer complexity that I think I'm sure people listening to this to this webinar have within their systems below the line, and the way that we struggle to represent that above the line. And again, the fact that we, you know, I actually think the points that he made about focusing on incidents and what effect that incidents has. What does that mean about your architecture? What does it mean about what you're brittle? What does it mean about you know what you need to, what actions you need to take um, in terms of evolving your architecture, your value stream, your 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 team structures, your talent, your training, whatever it is, in order to make sure that that next incident doesn't do that same thing. That you've got more safety around. Um, you know, around that part of the of the system. There's there kind of what's not right now that thinking about actually um, in terms of what's going to happen to them rather than um, architecting them ahead of time for every possible scenario uh, for these complex systems is, is going to be the, you know, the better approach. So, uh, Mick, uh, by the way, uh, for people who are listening, uh, Mick is one of my favorite people to talk to as we sort of synthesize these big ideas. There's two things that uh, I loved about the MIT beer game studies. Uh, one is, um, CEOs of Fortune 50 companies perform no better than high school students. In other words, <laughs> uh, supply chain knowledge uh, you know, and, you know, and business knowledge does not actually help uh, performance. Secondly, in almost every trial when they interview people as, they, you know, as uh, everyone's gone out of business, people are react with anger. They're like, someone that I'm playing with does not understand the rules. <laughs> uh, they cannot understand uh, that this is the only way to rationalize you know, the poor results. Uh, and I think this just shows how important fast feedback is and how critical having um, an accurate mental model uh, is. And so if we, if it's that hard for the MIT beer game, right, how, how much harder is it, you know, for a genuinely complex system with millions of nodes? Um, so uh, uh, love, love that you chose this one, Nick. Yeah, I just, I just want to throw one more thing at that because I think John has a very good sense for the cultural aspects of this as well. We've talked about mostly the technology but above and below the line, but these problems are complex enough. We, you know, we have a, our own biases in terms of how we see things above the line. And just uh, the, the way that um, John Alspaugh has taught the industry around putting in place blameless postmortems so that you actually get to the root causes and the shared understanding because you'll need a shared one. It's too complex for one person to understand now of what's happening below the line, what that incident caused, I think is key. So another I think key practice, like a key takeaway from this is, is you know, dig into what John's done on postmortems, look at putting in place these blameless postmortems for your organization because it's it's just too complex at this stage to to uh, to not do that. Awesome. Uh, let's see here. The next one is Ah the links okay. <laughs> so this was um there was a panel that I ran uh, on the third day that was probably one of the most rewarding professional experiences of my life. Uh, before that, we actually did a four-hour film session of these three gentlemen. Um, so one is uh, Dr. Sidney Decker, uh, who tremendously influenced the work of John Ospaugh. So he wrote many books, including a book called Just Culture, uh, Drift Into Failure. He's a professor at uh, uh, Queensland University, um, at the University of Brisbane. Uh, he uh, is credited for uh, really help create the first um, uh, making uh, the work of Dr. David Woods uh, at Ohio State University understandable. And it, this was actually what uh, got John Ospa into safety culture. Uh, the second person uh, is Dr. Stephen Spear. Uh, he, I consider him to be a mentor of mine. Uh, he uh, wrote, um, he's an adjunct uh, lecturer at MIT. Uh, he does did his PhD on the Toyota production system. Uh, he actually, as part of his PhD dissertation, um, worked on the plant floor of a tier one Toyota supplier for six months. Um, and uh, he wrote a book called The High Velocity Edge. And uh, uh, Mick, one of my favorite parts of uh, the book is actually the foreword that was written by Clay Christensen, uh, who wrote uh, The Innovator's Dilemma. And part of it, he said, is that the, that Dr. Spears' work may be the most significant work to come out of the Harvard Business School. That's probably the most amazing <laughs> foreword <it's> ever written. <laughs> and the third one is Dr. Richard Cook. Um, he wrote a chapter in uh, the Web Operations book uh, that John Alspa had put together in 2010. Um, uh, and he wrote a chapter called Why Complex Systems Fail, and essentially bridging the world of um, 
safety culture directly into uh, the DevOps domain and around internet operations. And uh, he's not a uh, PhD, he's actually a practicing physician, he's an anesthesiologist. And so the goal of this uh, panel, um, the, the, the panel was essentially the summarized output of the four hours we had in the morning to explore the commonalities between lean and safety culture um, and explore places of genuine divergence. And I, uh, I listened to the, this panel uh, five times. I, mean, I, just, I just thought every sentence was so meaningful and I, I felt like I was getting smarter every time I listened to it. So on the next slide, I summarized some of my learnings. Um, um, so I, I think there is this I, th I think this more than anything cemented for me this uh, conviction that DevOps is drawing upon these two schools of thought the most uh, in terms of lean. I mean, that's where we get so much of our language around flow and value streams and so forth, and safety culture uh, in terms of and sometimes safety culture is known as resilience engineering or um, uh, human factors. You know, um, you know, if you take a look at the Hawaii uh, Civil Defense Missile Alert, right? I mean, that was a that was the human factors issue, right? The fact that there was seven. Uh, menu items all look the same, right? And one was rehearsed, one was uh, you know a real missile alert. Someone clicked on the wrong button. Yeah, that's not a human error. That's a that's a profound design error. Um, uh, there was a, a point that was made so uh, brilliant by all three panelists uh, about the need for not just psychological safety, right? It's just uh, uh, as Dr. Decker said, it's very easy to you know say make it safe for everyone to talk, but you know the more challenging part is usually the symmetry needed by the leader, right? That, uh, as Dr. Spears said, it takes a stunning amount of humility to be able to uh, say, I don't know, or uh, to say I was wrong. As he said, uh, you can't uh, talk about psychological safety and then have the leader act like a pompous jackass, right? That uh, uh, So it takes some often profound changes in cultural norms and what it even, um, what it take what even the, lead, the behaviors we want to model as leaders. Uh, there was a great discussion about um, um, uh, the investigation into the high-profile accidents in uh, the South Pacific in the U.S. Navy. I think there's been three or four collisions of, uh, between uh, U.S. warships and uh, civilian ships uh, resulting in loss of life, um, you know, horrendous uh, loss of uh, 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 you know, both in casualties and property damage, etc. And uh, there was a phrase that Dr. Spears said about is like how we talk about near misses, right? Uh, we, we know that we have to talk about not just the accidents, but all the times when we didn't have an accident, specifically the near misses. And do we talk about it? We can talk about it in one of two ways. One is, you know, through the lens of heroism. In other words, yes, we were in danger, but, uh, you know, thanks to bravery and good decisions, you know, we avoided the accident. Or is the narrative. Uh, you know, we were we were not in control. You know, uh, but, you know, as Dr. Spears said, there by the grace of God go I. You know, we were this close um, to having an accident, and it was due to luck. But here's what we did, and, and so the first, there's nothing to learn from. The second um, actually does help inform. Like when we are in situations where we have lost or are nearing the loss of control, what can we do to help prevent uh, a catastrophic outcome? Um, so I, I thought that was uh, just a uh, just an incredible way to frame, I think, what we need out of these bodies of knowledge. And the third uh, that was very memorable to me is uh, came from Dr. Cook in terms of like the ethics of DevOps. Uh, in the airline industry, pilots do not consider themselves – they consider themselves first and foremost pilots, regardless of who their employer is. Um, and they just happen to be working at a specific airline at the time. And, and I love this notion, and I think maybe one of the, the new aspirations for this year is what can we do to help inform, uh, you know, what the ethics of DevOps are. You know, are we a community of practice that really transcends the organization that happens to employ us? Um, uh, so those are uh, sorry for rambling on, but I mean, this is something I just found very meaningful and uh, impactful. Uh, Mick, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, so for, this was all news to me. So I had never dug into safety culture. I was just curious and wondering why, you know, you introduced it uh, to the community basically at, at this conference, Gene, and and the it it was it was eye opening to me. I, you know, both in terms of the presentations I had a chance to chat with Dr. Cook and so on, 
and others. And uh, for me, it's I, I think it's it just shows uh, where we're headed and just the fact that the the criticality to the business of the decisions that are being made or the mistakes that are being made, right? We've got these very large software platforms. We've got all the all organizations are trying to bring more. All enterprise IT organizations are trying to bring more to market. Um, the safety criticality, the security footprints are growing, and if we don't start learning from these, you know, these lessons from the um, from this other you know, chunk of the industry, other chunk of the economy, we're not gonna have the right kind of culture, we're not gonna have the right kind of decision-making, problem-solving, or as you said, generative to identify these problems, right? And there's someone in your organization, you might have a massive security hole in your organization. Your business might be on the brink of collapse because, uh, because of how big that footprint is. If someone gets into it, you might have that Equifax scenario happening and, and someone will know that. But if the narrative is, is of blame, or if the narrative is, is not of this kind of constructive um, problem solving, uh, those things might not come out. And it's this, it's just, I mean, for me, I'm still just processing all of this, right? Because I've done some, you know, I had some, uh, uh, did some work at university, some courses on human factors, but the connection between human factors, just the safety criticality of the systems, some of which, you know, run our financial industry, some of which run hospitals um, or, or, or missile systems. Um, all of this is, I think, on the precipice of us needing to very, very quickly learn about what's worked in terms of safety culture and uh, how we apply that. Because I think that the biggest thing for me there is really how it applies to the way that we manage software delivery and the kind of, again, the kind of culture we need, we need these examples that John Oswald has got like, of the blameless postmortems that I think some, a lot of organizations out there going through the digital transformations have to shift into very, very quickly. So. I think this is this is one I'm personally going to dig into and look forward to chatting with you, Morjean, because there's uh, there's something very significant happening here that, that I, I feel I need to catch up on. <laughs> so yeah, you know, it, to, to summarize uh, what I learned in the Beyond the Phoenix project, which is coming out in March, um, is uh, essentially Decker was actually really came, came up with Safety One and Safety Two. Safety One, uh, the Safety One response to the Hawaii missile accident would be, uh, this is a uh, operator error. We need more training. We need more. Uh, we need more compliance checks. Right? You know, we gotta. We gotta. Uh, we gotta. Uh, increase the number of controls, right, and maybe authorization controls, right, uh, you know, to uh, reduce the uh, bad outcome from happening. Safety two is saying, you know, uh, it, it's not the human that's the problem; it's the system that's the problem. And uh, you know, so clearly, you know, uh, the, the the famous stories of B seventeen um, uh, landing gear things. They found that uh, often pilots, uh, after they had landed the B seventeen, uh, they would. Uh, raise the flaps and then accidentally raise the landing gear uh, which would cause the plane to plop on the ground destroy the propellers and so forth uh, and so they found no matter how much training how much they would weed out the, the pilot uh, the pilots who are underperforming um, you know this is, the accidents kept on happening and uh, what, until some engineer uh, discovered that the flap switch and the landing gear switch were right next to each other and they were the same <laughs> size and shape, and wow. so the the countermeasure was on the flaps. They put a uh, like a curved piece of metal, you know, to, you know, it's like the shape of the flaps. And on the landing gear control, they put a wheel on it, you know, <laughs> so that there would be some tactile feedback, and the accident rate went to zero. So, uh, you know, this, uh, the modern treatment of this is uh, interaction design, UX, you know, uh, and so forth. So, uh, you know. Uh, it, uh, it was the, that was the first time I heard I understood why they call it human factors as opposed to um, you know resilience engineering or safety culture. Uh, all right, back to you, Mick. Yeah, and I think as we go into the next talk, um, I think there's there's for me at the conference there was this there was this common theme as well, right? Is we've got so there's the Deming quote of a bad system will beat a good person every time, um, hmm. and the degree to which these are complex systems are you know the end to end delivery pipeline which includes. Yeah, I just ima always imagine that as the network of every single person, every single team, and how they're interconnected, and just you know, the basically the way that these systems get in the way of people doing work uh, today, and either encourage mistakes or hide problems or so on, is is just something we have to get past. And I think Chris Hill has got a great mind for this. So he's uh, he's a Jaguar Land Rover, uh, and he's been trying to put this this kind of new connectivity, this new way of connecting through the the end-to-end -end systems of software delivery to place at 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 JLR. So 
he had, but he, and I think we've seen a lot of this, I'm not going to rehash this into how you have to break through silos and connect the different backlogs and teams and systems. He did something that I, I just had not, it was, I feel like I should have understood it before, but I didn't quite understand it until he, he was taking me through till I, till I saw his presentation. And so he drew, and we've all seen this different sort of value stream diagrams or to, whether we look at them as tool chains or how teams are connected um, or layered and so on. And he drew this diagram of an organization uh, that he'd been familiar with. And of course, everything works when it's a small set of teams. But he drew, he, he showed us various diagrams through his presentation. I really encourage you to watch it because he actually drew these lines of empathy. So for example, you know, kind of a product owner who maybe has been a developer or technical can probably empathize with a, with a developer um, or a, but they might have to, or, or a hardware designer, but the customer, for example, might not empathize with that designer. And so the way that those people are connected um, is actually, you know, they're, they're basically speaking different languages, right? One might be very focused on these human factors, one might be focused just purely on architecture. And so he took us through this walk through an organization and looked at actually the lines of empathy of how people understand what they're doing. And he, uh, you know, and I'll just you know, quickly jump into the summary of his lessons learned, but basically saying as people need to switch tasks and context between these different capabilities, sometimes jumping into a whole new environment, usually jumping into a whole new tool, things just get lost. Information gets lost, we don't learn. Uh, empathy, and he's actually looking at how we can connect these teams and you know, obviously the Spotify team, cross-functional teams, help actually bridge some of those lines of empathy, help people understand each other. And again, a way to look at this is how you, both from a collaboration perspective and from just a, a team building and culture perspective, connect those above the line models, whether it's the problem solve around an incident or, or just to get work done, just to you know break out a, an interesting feature into the work that needs to be done to, to get it delivered. Um, and then he did have this interesting view as well is that using basically connecting the tool set, connecting the way that work is being done, connecting the communication, actually reduces the penalty of those switches and then brings the people closer together rather than having this problem we've had of just throwing things over the fence, right? The architects throwing the, the architecture over the fence and some specification, uh, the product owners throwing wireframes over the fence and you know, identifying how big a failure problem this is and then kind of into flow this is. Um, and if, then if, so I think this this was kind of fascinating to me, but looking at it not just as the way we've been talking about for a long time, but actually looking at connecting those people and then those lines of empathy, and then again, those shared above the line models in the end, so. Uh, what I find so interesting about uh, Chris Hill's uh, presentations is just uh, the complexity of the software supply chain, how across how many uh, different engineering firms are working and the suppliers and so forth. So uh, yeah, the enormity of the problems that uh, he is uh, solving are, are just uh, breathtaking. Um, yeah, we have uh, 13 minutes left. Uh, so how about we just uh, keep? Uh, we'll, we'll I like the we'll stick to your faster pace. Um, my next one is Capital One. So Topo Pal uh, has presented at um, DevOps Enterprise for four years in a row, um, and is one of the most interesting people in the DevOps Enterprise community. This year. He chose to present with uh, Jennifer Brady. Uh, she is Director of Technology Governance at Capital One. And so uh, what I love about this presentation is on the next slide. So one is, it has been one of the uh, uh, many-year mission uh, um, for Topo to show that, uh, the, uh, that we can be even more secure using continuous delivery than we can with status quo, or yeah, as he would assert, even far more secure. And uh, what made this presentation so interesting was that you presented with uh, Jennifer Brady, who used to be the director of internal audit, uh, of IT audit uh, at Capital One. And so she comes from a community of auditors. Uh, we were both, uh, I was a due paying member at the uh, Institute of Internal Auditors for nearly a decade. Um, and the fact that uh, she has partnered with Topo to show that um, to make DevOps defensible, not only to internal security and compliance teams, but legal, external uh, assessors, auditors, and regulators, uh, was just incredible. Just showing how that, uh, you know, here's Topo working with someone with a deep domain expertise in audit and compliance, in control environments, uh, was just incredible. And uh, one of the highlights for me was um, how the rigor of why Topo rejected the notion of, you know, we'll just have 
in order to get the separation of duty concerns uh, met, we'll just have someone else push the button. And he uh, just logically attacked this, saying that this is there's no outcome of this that is actually good for Capital One. Right? The, the instant they become, even if you pick someone who doesn't have any skills to push the button, the instant they do become uh, more skillful, you know, they won't want to push the button anymore. They want to become a developer. I mean, it's just the uh, the integrity of which. Um, he thought through the control environment uh, was just uh, breathtaking. So, uh, Capital One was, uh, that's why that was among my favorites. Yeah, and I, I think I really enjoyed Topo's point as well, Gene. And the, I think, you know, the big thing is, I don't know, I, it just seems, and this was a bit of a theme in some of the talks, definitely some of the ones that, that resonated with me, is that I think there's been too much within the organizations I speak to, the customers I speak to, of this of this either or, right? That we're going to go, okay, let's do this green fields, get some new tool chain, get, get, um, and do this greenfields development, and later figure out how to work it within our controls, work it into our um, our large scale delivery process as we learn. And I, I just the organizations are succeeding with scaling more quickly rather than just this endless experimenting. That that's really you know in this bimodal type way that uh, that I think is very self limiting. Um, they're actually thinking about this up front, and the, it's it's even back to um, John Smart's talk, which is that you can have speed and control. You should architect your value streams. With controls into it, and then I think you know Topo had some very interesting insights in terms of how you do that, and then the you know the, this button pusher role not being an effective an effective way of doing it. But I think that the thing that I've seen work, and this this goes right back to open source projects, where it's not an either or of having traceability or controls. You just build that in to your you know to your tool automation and value stream, um, and and then you, you you basically get both. It's I remember it was actually Tom Grant who told me way back that. He did an, while he was at Forrester. He did an analysis of highly regulated, agile, highly re regulated industries, very traditional horses, and he found better throughput because they had actually properly architected their, for their flow to make sure the controls didn't impede their flow, and that caused them to actually have a more mature agile deployment rather than the, a very ad hoc one. So I think this is a this, this is the approach to take to, to build this right in. So. Um, awesome. Nine minutes, let's accelerate. Dominica de Grandes. Um, <laughs> I think, so Dominica's got, uh, just, I read her book in the fall, and I think the Making Work Visible on IT Revolution Press, it's a, it's an amazing book. Um, she took us through some of the ideas there that I want to highlight. She actually took us through a very personal perspective on internet presentation, because it's how we manage our own time, how we manage our own whip. Uh, whereas a lot of her work that I, I really encourage people to read is how to make work visible across the organization. But it's really interesting the way that her concepts actually scale from sort of personal time management to the team and then to the organization. So uh, I think you know the amazing thing is that Dominica, I think there, there are a few sort of key concepts that I think that came out in this talk and that, that come out in her work, which is uh, that we really need to look at end-to-end -end flow and to focus on flow time. Other things are important. Um, so we've got cycle times important in terms of you know, how quickly we're able to, you know, development teams are able to get through user, you know, from start to end on a, on a user story. But really, Dominica's focusing on end-to-end -end flow time, which some call lead time, but she's had, I think, enough frustration with that debate. She's actually put this idea out there we should look at at, at flow time from when work starts to when it's done. Not code to complete to deploy, but completely end-to-end. -end. And She's got these exercises uh, for organizations, for teams to do in the book, where you really start analyzing your flow time, because that is how you get to finding your bottlenecks, to understanding whether your bottleneck is more upstream, to understanding whether you're, you know, you're actually waiting on uh, acceptance criteria to be specified, or you just don't have enough designers, because most enterprise IT organizations have a tenth of the UX designers, and even the human factors considerations that, that result from that, uh, then you know, some of the digital native companies and, and the new startups. So she, Dominica here has got some really nice models and sort of workshop exercises you can try on your own or uh, you can reach out to her on in terms of how you start looking at you know, whatever you're interested in, either your own personal your teams or your organizations end-to-end -end flow time. And we've been really building on that in terms of just populating uh, this information, obviously, with the whole value stream network. Because the interesting thing is that all of this information for end-to-end -end flow time, from basically when a customer request came in, when an incident came in, to when you deployed that fix, when a feature request came in or something on your business strategy came in, to when you deployed that, and look at flow efficiency and bottlenecks. All of this is, is, is possible to do right now when you sort of formalize your tool chain and, and your value stream network. So she got that point across as well. Gene, anything to add there? Uh, uh, she's one of the best thinkers and doers in the space. And 
Yeah, uh, and her book is fabulous. Prime now. Prime now. Okay, let's do this in 90 seconds. Uh, Tristan Matthew was the director of engineering at Amazon. And, and uh, what I love about the story is that this, the making of Amazon Prime now has never really been told. And what I think is so instructive about this case study is that everyone thinks doing things at Amazon is easy. But imagine uh, having to deliver this capability where you click an order and it shows up on your door with between you know 15 minutes and three hours. And this breaks every <laughs> component that you have to work with. Shopping cart. Uh, order fulfillment. Uh, it basically, you now have to touch over 300 different teams, and so Amazon is very decentralized. Imagine uh, having to be reliant upon 300 teams that actually don't care about what your initiative is. <laughs> that uh, that uh, essentially the lever, the only lever you have is saying that Jeff Bezos needs this. And it's now up to this engineering director to make it happen, and he tells a story about how uh, this was built. And that to create Amazon Prime now required cutting across the three primary functions of Amazon, ordering, fulfillment, and transportation. This was originally thought to be just primarily a transportation problem, but in, involved uh, profound changes to almost every business process uh, at Amazon. What I love about it uh, is the story is that um, uh, it just explains why the Amazon Prime Now app is different the Amazon, from the Amazon app. Right? So much was different that it was just easier to create a new app. Uh, I think it also informs why we need something like Scale to Agile in organizations that, uh, as you said, how to do this outside of a team is not well specified. Uh, and I think the Tiss and Matthew one shows kind of what is required uh, to make this happen. Uh, and there's a, a certainly an architectural um, discussion about like uh, what do you do when you are reliant upon 300 services and you know you have to wait an indefinite amount of time? How do you engineer your work uh, so that you can actually model against something that you know, you, despite the fact that you don't have what you need from those teams? Um, I, I love this presentation. All right, and my uh, 90 seconds now is Troy McGinnis. He had this was. This I just never had this this view on things. I think the you know what we're seeing is a bit more formalization and a bit more dovetailing of some of the as you just touched on Gene, the scaled at scaling agile concepts with you know the value stream. Um, and so with Troy McGinnis, who's got some tremendous experience at you know just some amazing you know scaling delivery at some organizations like like Skype, for example. Uh, he took us through a more formal view of you know, some of what some of us think of as this uh, as this fuzzy front end, but just the sheer amount of work and the sheer amount of uh, that goes into prioritization, into specifying these requirements, and the kinds of ways of doing that um, in terms of getting an optimal decision for what work will be done. Uh, so this is he's come up with. I'm just going to flip through this really quickly, but he just has. If if this is something that's of interest to you in terms of you know whether you adopt safe out of the box and using. Um, in, in terms of how you prioritize work and what work you do, um, or whether you use the, you know, in his terms here, the hippo, the highest per, uh, person uh, as the prioritization, these things can be extremely consequential in terms of what work gets done. And he's got this very nice framework uh, that's, there's a link in the, in the slide deck that's downloadable, but in terms of what kinds of decisions and how we make those decisions and how we formalize that kind of work. So for example, we can have in the top left here, low to medium impact, of being wrong, of whether we need to do this feature, this security fix over that, uh, where, whether it's, we can have high impact. And I think this is this was what was so interesting, again, about the, the safety, culture, and human factors aspects that came out in this DevOps Enterprise Summit that was very uh, new to me and interesting to me is that business leaders routinely make decisions on what work should be prioritized that actually have this tremendously high impact of being wrong, where choosing can be fatal. Uh, it can cause a life, it can cause your, your, your business to falter, it can cause you to get Equifax. So we actually need to work in, in terms of the types of work that we prioritize. Not only do we need uh, this, this safety and culture that embraces vulnerability and being wrong in terms of making sure that those things surface to the business, we need to give this the business a language to make those trade-offs between racing to market on this new product and this new set of features versus doing this security fix or this hardening or these architecture changes, um, authentication changes first. And Troy's actually got, I think, a, a very mature, to me, a very a, a appealing framework for how you could frame the types of work that's, that are being done in the pipeline uh, by engineering uh, into business decisions. And I think we're starting to see that because, again, these things are so consequential. Uh, we actually need to, I think, formalize that business language with the work that's being done in the in the delivery pipeline. 
Dean? Man, what a great segue, because uh, certainly one of the most impactful presentations was uh, the presentation that you did with Carmen Diardo at Nationwide. And, and this is almost the orthogonal axis. I think what's so interesting about uh, the, the things that you're putting together in the volume stream architecture shows uh, a way for us to express the conditions that we've all seen before. In other words, it's, uh, in the presentation, you talk about the flow metrics, uh, about uh, how it informs engineering and business decisions, all in the quest for faster flow. And I love uh, what's an aha moment for me over the uh, many months that we've been talking about this is that it just explains, you can now express what are the conditions that causes technical debt to cause throughput to grind to the halt uh, and actually lead to dangerous outages like uh, LinkedIn 2009 or um, you know, uh, being able to create a uh, uh, having an architecture where you can actually make urgent changes, uh, for example, maybe in a different world, you know, we could have actually quickly patched the Equifax systems um, uh, that led to, and the you know, inability to do that led to uh, the big breach. Uh, and it actually shows this virtual cycle we can get to if we can keep maximizing developer productivity and increasing flow, explaining the conditions that led to the birth of the automated testing culture at Google. So I think this is very complementary to Troy McGinnis' talk uh, about uh, a decision-making framework uh, and what should inform a great architecture. So uh, a definitely a, a phenomenal, exciting ideas coming out of the conference. Yeah, I think this is, uh, as Gina, as you can imagine, this is this is what it's taking the most, is taking these architectural principles, these developer productivity principles, these automation principles, into this into this end-to-end, -end, you know, what we're understanding is now of this value stream network, uh, how we formalize that, how we learn from it, and so that's something we could, we'll talk about in the future. Uh, but let's wrap up. Uh, Gene, uh, let us know where we should all be flying to next. Oh, hey, that DevOps Enterprise London is uh, coming. This is the third year of the London Conference on June 25th and 26th. Uh, the announcement just went out last night that uh, blind bird pricing is open, so that's uh, discounted because there's no scheduling details or some very uh, some speaker details. Um, but I can promise you it's going to be the best conference uh, in London yet. Uh, and we just opened up uh, the call for presentations, uh, and specifically we're looking for exciting ideas happening in operations. Um, what does next generation operations look like, especially around immutability, functional programming? composition, composability, and so forth. Um, and so uh, stay tuned for a more expansive uh, description of uh, a track just dedicated to next generation operations. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to That's you great. and uh, Alan. Thank you. Gene, I'm here. Gene, Mick, great. That was a great recap of some of the, I mean, I would say highlights, but they were all highlights. So that was a recap of 10 of the great presentations it does, but there's a lot more. I encourage people to check out the IT revolution a YouTube channel to get more. Uh, they've all been videoed and you can watch them there. You can also catch interviews of many of the speakers on our DevOps TV channel, including several with Mick. Gene, uh, DevOps Enterprise Summit London is at O2 this year, which is, I think, like one of the largest auditoriums in Europe. Really should be a fantastic event if, if people listening can make it. Uh, to our friends at Tastop, thank you so much for sponsoring today. Mick, as usual, a great job. I think we have a few more webinars coming up with you. We're looking forward to them. But we're going to call a wrap on this one. It's uh, after the hour. Respect your, everyone's time. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Uh, this is Alan Schimmel for DevOps.com, and have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.